Good morning to everyone. It's good to see you here at Linden Christian Church today. From Psalm 84.4, we read, O God, blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praises. I thought that might work well for us today because we're going to do that. We are in God's house and we're going to sing together and, and we are blessed. We are truly, truly blessed. I'm going to open in prayer and I had noticed on a prayer list there are several who have had surgeries recently. Sylvia Combs uh, received hip surgery, doing well. Ellen Hassel uh, recovering from complete knee replacement is now at the Nazareth home. And Steve Frank recovering from hip surgery. And then there are several others on the prayer list. If you would like to take one of these prayer lists and pray, some of you are doing that, and I appreciate that. I think uh, the, those who are on the prayer list appreciate that. Uh, so much so that one fellow told me this week, he said, I can't find a prayer list. Of course, it was the middle of the week, and he should have got it maybe on Sunday. I don't know. But so, uh, Shorty, maybe we need to make a few extras. I don't know. But uh, isn't it great that uh, we can pray, that we have an avenue of prayer to go to God, and that he cares for us? Even when the whole world is going to, uh, away from the Lord, not going to church as much as we do, Still, we can go to God and we can pray. And so let's pray right now as we begin our worship. Would you bow with me? Thank you, Father, for salvation through Jesus Christ. Thank you for these whom we love and are concerned about that are on our prayer list. Thank you, Father, that uh, they're doing well. And we do pray for those who are healing from surgeries and injuries and accidents and depression and problems that they face. Father, Lift us up, give us strength and a blessing by being in, uh, in your house today. Look into our hearts, see our needs, and bless us through your son Jesus, in whose name we now pray. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I might read a few verses. It was the Apostle Paul who, who wrote 1 Corinthians, and he wanted us to know about the Lord's Supper. It was very important to him. And uh, he wanted to pass that on to the church. So a few verses here in 1 Corinthians 11 says, For I received from the Lord that what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. As often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It was a little over a year ago that Rhonda and I were in Israel on a tour of the Holy Land. And there were many memorable scenes and events that we witnessed, just more than I can even remember. But one event that was especially noteworthy was when our small group of 13 people participated in the remembrance of the institution of the Lord's Supper. It was really not a lot different than our shared time of communion here at Linden Christian, except that it, I don't know, it just seemed more relevant as we read the scriptures and as we partook of the emblems of our Lord's body and blood right there in the land where our master first instituted the Lord's Supper. Rhonda and I may never be able to visit Israel again. Times are kind of hard over there right now. It's dangerous, but it has always been dangerous, I suppose. But we partake of the Lord's Supper each Lord's Day. And we do this as a remembrance of what Jesus instituted for us, the church, us. This morning, as we once again partake together of this communion, may we remember how Jesus loved us and gave his life for us, how his body was beaten and broken, how he shed his blood on Calvary. The sinless Lamb of God shed his blood for our sins. May we remember how he was buried and rose again to life after three days to live forevermore. And as he now lives, may we look forward to the time when we shall live forevermore and be with him in heaven for eternity. 
Let's pray and then we'll partake together of the bread and the juice. Thank you, Father, for this sacrifice of our Lord and Savior. Sometimes we read in the Bible that maybe for a friend, a man might lay down his life, but surely not for the whole world. But Jesus did. For those who love him and follow him, as we attempt to do, and for those who would turn their backs on Christ. But Father, he died for everyone. May we remember that as we partake of this, representing his body and his blood just now. In Jesus' name, amen. The bread. And the fruit of the vine. How's everybody doing? Good. Glad to see everyone here this morning. Uh, it's a beautiful day, and they did a beautiful job uh, leading us in worship. That was wonderful. I appreciate uh, all the hard work that they go into. Yeah, uh, making sure that we have good singing. Come on. I'm on, right? Uh, let me pray for us, and then we'll get started. God, thank you so much for uh, this morning, and thank you so much for each and every person here. Thank you so much for how you've blessed them and, and you have uh, provided for them. God, thank you so much for your love and your grace and your compassion in our life. Thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, and for sending him into this, into this world to die for our sins. And uh, God, we just pray that you would help us uh, in our daily uh, lives, in our uh, daily walk. Help us to be focused on you and everything that we do. I pray that you would help us to, um, to be laser focused on you and your will for our life. And I pray that everything that we do would be uh, in response to what you've done for us. That we would live lives of love and grace because you've loved, and, you've loved us and you've given us grace. God, I pray that you would help us to be blessings in the lives of other people because you have blessed us. I help everything that we do and say be for you and your kingdom. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Uh, the Greek word is akity. It's where we derive our English word ascetic. In Greek, it means apathy, indifference, carelessness, or listlessness. In her 1957 book, Desert Fathers, Helen Waddell said that this feeling within the heart was what drove Christians in the early church out to the desert. Laziness, boredom, an absence of passion in the heart drove men to seek out and pursue suffering. In the same way, Jesus experienced it. Like what we talked about last week when he experienced the physical suffering in the desert when he was tormented by Satan but also the spiritual suffering he experienced in his crucifixion. They took the words of Paul to heart when he said, I beat my body and bring it under submission. He said that in 1 Corinthians 9, 27. They took literally his words of how he spoke of wanting to know Christ and the power of his resurrection through sharing in his sufferings. At Philippians 3.10. They believed their faith was lacking. Because of the apathy. They felt in their heart. And so in order to reignite their passion. For the gospel. They went out into the desert. To live as hermits and ascetics. They engaged in all sorts of creative punishments. To endure suffering with the hope that they would be able to know Christ deeper and experience the resurrection fuller. Men like Anthony the Great, considered by many to be the first Christian monk, he, he ate only bread, salt, and water, and never more than once a day. He would often fast for up to four days at a time. He, he lived alone in a tomb Later, he lived in an abandoned fort. He would eventually have disciples come out to him in the desert, asking him to teach them his ways. 
And they would form the very first monastic community. People like Simon Stylite. He was another one of the so-called desert fathers. He lived on a platform on top of a pillar for 37 years. Uh, Isidore the Simple, he lived in a hut in the deserts of Africa. And one day his roof began to leak. And instead of fixing the leak, he happily accepted the suffering of sleeping while water dripped on his head for years. Uh, There were people who lived on eating snakes and scorpions. They would wear shirts made out of human hair. I can only imagine how itchy that was. Uh, One guy lived in a cage that was too short to stand upright and too small to lay down flat. They fasted. They lived alone. They slept on the ground and in caves. They engaged in extreme self-punishment in an effort to become more like Christ. In an effort to put their flesh to death. As Christians, we're called to do that, to put our flesh to death, or as the theologian John Owen called it, mortify sin. Paul said this at Romans 8.13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will die live. So the question is this, is the way of the desert fathers living as a hermit, taking vows of poverty and chastity, extreme fasting, self-punishment, is that the way to put to death the deeds of the body? Is that what Paul meant at Romans 8.13? Do we need to engage in these extreme forms of asceticism in order to put to death our fleshly desires? I would contend that is not what he meant. And we're going to look at a passage of Scripture uh, this morning that gives us a glimpse, uh, a more in-depth glimpse, into what exactly is meant by the phrase, put to death the deeds of the body. The passage is Colossians chapter 3. You can go ahead and turn there if you have your Bibles. Uh, We also have Bibles provided for you if you'd like to use one of those. And we'll also have the words on the screen behind me. But we're we're nearing the end of this sermon series that we've been in in over the last uh, few weeks called Laser Focused. And we're talking about remedies for the things in our life that hinder us from being laser focused on Jesus, because that's what we want to do, right? We want to be laser focused on Jesus, but there are things in our life that keep us from doing that. Uh, Caroline had a, a really good idea uh, that she told me the other day. Uh, she told us that, or she told me that, that what we should have done is handed out laser pointers at the, at the beginning of this sermon series so everyone could remember about the sermon series, and, and I, I told her, man, that's, that's a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? Um, so maybe y'all can go out and buy yourself a laser pointer uh, to remember this series, sermon series. Maybe I'll ask Caroline for some other good ideas uh, for upcoming sermon series, but, uh, but we're, we're going to start a new sermon series in three weeks on June, starting on June 23rd. So be on the lookout for that. We'll be in a six-week, we'll start a a six-week-long sermon series through the Minor Prophets. Uh, So if you you open your your Bible to just right of center, you'll notice that there's a series of of 12 books uh, that are are relatively short. Uh, The longest ones are Hosea and Zechariah, and they both have 14 chapters. Most of them have three and four chapters. Haggai only has two chapters, and Obadiah is only one chapter. You can sit down and read the entire book of Obadiah in about 10 minutes. Um, but, but through that series, we're going to do an overview of six of those minor prophets. And, and we'll probably hit the other six at some other point in the future. But, but we're going to talk about how those six books, or what those six books have to say about our Christian mission. The, the, those books were written before Jesus gave his disciples uh, the mission to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. 
Uh, but that mission was based on the teachings of the Old Testament. And so that, that series is called Not So Minor Mission. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, next week, we'll finish up this series on being laser focused. The following week after that, Jim will have a special Father's Day message for us uh, before we begin that new sermon series on the 23rd. Uh, so the summertime, a lot of times, uh, is a time when, when people are not very consistent in their attendance. People take vacations. They are doing a lot of other things. Uh, but we have a lot of ex- uh, things to be excited about here on Sunday mornings uh, here at Linden. So I want to encourage all of you to make every effort to be here as much as you can this summer uh, so you don't miss out. Uh, But this morning, we're going to continue in our teaching about spiritual disciplines, uh, which are just activities, practices that you can implement in your life that help you grow spiritually. Uh, The spiritual disciplines we've been talking about have been uh, about focusing our mind on Christ. But our flesh tempts us to set our mind on earthly things. Uh, Last week, we talked about overcoming our fleshly temptations. Uh, That was the beginner course. I told you today was the master course. So good job for coming in. You weren't weren't intimidated at all. Uh, There's there's one thing that we're going to talk about this morning that is absolute kryptonite to your flesh. And that's what we're going to talk about. If if you're familiar with Superman, uh, he was invincible, right? But there was one thing that, uh, that zapped his powers. It was uh, a, a rock from his home planet, Krypton, called Kryptonite. Uh, if he came in contact with that, that rock, he, it would zap his powers. Uh, Superman was obviously well after Paul's time. Uh, but I, I like to think that if Paul knew about Superman, he would probably use the same, same illustration. Um, uh, here, and he would probably say it right here, Colossians 3. I think. Uh, So if you have your Bibles, uh, let's read that together. Colossians chapter 3. We're just going to read the first 10 verses. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge After the image of its creator. Here in Colossians 3, Paul exhorted those who have been raised with Christ to seek the things that are above. Set your mind on the things that are above. And not what is earthly in you. I'll go ahead and tell you, I'll let the cat out of the bag. The thing that is kryptonite to your flesh is being raised with Christ. Because it zaps your flesh's power. Your your flesh, before you are raised with Christ, is like Superman. But when you are raised with Christ, the power flesh has over you is zapped. Like kryptonite. Paul said that that you once walked in these things when you were living in them. These are the things that are earthly in you. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness. Which is idolatry. You once walked in these things. But now you have been raised with Christ. So you no longer do. 
In chapter 2, just before this passage we read at chapter 3, Paul explained exactly what being raised with Christ means. Why is it that being raised with Christ is such a vital piece to no longer walking in the earthly things that you once walked? Uh, Colossians 2, 11 and 12 says this, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of, of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith, in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. In baptism, Paul said, we are buried with Christ. When we go down into the water, we die and are buried, just like Jesus was. Our old self with our old practices dies and is buried. To put to death the body of flesh is for it to be dead and buried. If you want to kill the flesh, mortify sin, kill it before it kills you, get baptized. In baptism, we put to death the body of the flesh. It dies and is buried, and we are raised up with Christ, just as Jesus died and was buried uh, in the tomb, and then three days later, he was raised back to life. That is what happens to us in baptism. Our old self dies, and we are raised to walk in newness of life. We're raised with Christ, and this, and there is a spiritual work that takes place in the moment of baptism. We receive a circumcision done without hands in which our flesh is cut away from us. Paul Paul paints this picture of old, dead, necrotic tissue being cut away so that the new living tissue is able to prosper and grow. This is what we call regeneration. Regeneration. When our flesh is cut away from our spirit so that the spirit can be made alive. This cutting away of the flesh is the zapping of its power, so to speak. The the prophet Ezekiel predicted that this would take place. He even predicted it would take place in the moment of baptism. Uh, Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27 says this, I will sprinkle clean water on you. And you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. Which I don't think is a word, but that's how they translate it. You shall be clean from all your uncleannesses. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. The clean water is a very clear reference to baptism. But, but this doesn't mean that we should baptize by sprinkling. Every New Testament baptism was done by full immersion in water, and so uh, we follow that pattern. The the sprinkling here is a reference to the Day of Atonement. There was a ceremony where the high priest would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat in the temple. And the water of baptism represents the blood of the sacrifice, which cleanses us of all our uncleannesses. Uh, Continuing verse 26, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. About 600 years before Jesus came, Ezekiel spoke these words. This is the circumcision done without hands. God gives us a new heart, a heart of flesh. He removes our old heart of stone. And Paul said that this takes place in the moment of baptism 
through faith. And if this has happened to you, if you have been raised with Christ through faith in baptism, seek the things that are above. If your flesh has died and has been buried, put to death the old self. There is an already and not yet reality to the killing of the flesh. Your flesh has already died. It has already been buried, but it is not yet completely gone. Your flesh was dead and buried, but you still walk around in it. And so do not allow it to control your mind. It doesn't make sense to go back to living like you were living before in the flesh. It doesn't make sense to seek the things you were seeking before. In baptism, you make a declaration of faith. That you believe that Jesus has been raised from the dead and that he is now seated at the right hand of God. That is the declaration you make in your baptism. That's what your faith entails. And so, your new life ought to be consistent with the faith that you have declared. If you believe that Jesus has been raised and you have been raised in baptism... If both of these things are true, then your new life should be raised above all earthly things. The focus of your new life that God has given you in Christ is now Christ. We are to be laser focused now on Christ. You're to be, you're to be spiritually minded now, not earthly minded. Everything in your life, your work, your, your lifestyle, your relationships, your goals, your desires are now all orientated above where Christ is and not below where it was before. The new heart was given to you for that very reason. So, so that you would walk in His statutes and be careful to obey his rules. Now, la last week I said it was the beginner class, right? And the, because last week I gave you three things that will help you to overcome your fleshly temptations. Three things that will help you to focus on Christ instead of your fleshly desires. If, if that's all you ever do is those three things that I talked about last week. Basically, they, they were engaging in spiritual activities and, and, try, and finding fulfillment in those. Uh, set clear boundaries so that you don't put yourself into compromising situations. And uh, spend your time with other like-minded people with those same boundaries. The, so that you won't give in to your temptations. Those are the three things that I talked about last week that will help you overcome your temptations. If that's all you ever do, there's a word for that. For just doing those three things. It's religion. It's basically behavior modification. It's basically the basis for every single religion out there. Do good and don't do bad. Try really, 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 really hard to do good. And try really, 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 really hard not to do bad. Right? Right? Set these boundaries, right? So that you do good and you don't do bad, right? If you do that, you will overcome temptation. But that's not the Christian faith. It's a part of it, to be sure. But, but last week's sermon could just have easily been preached by a Mormon preacher or a Buddhist monk. Or a Hindu guru or a Muslim imam. The, there, there are differences, probably. There would be differences in some of the specifics that I talked about last week. But what all of those religious teachers will tell you is basically the same thing. Engage in spiritual practices. Set moral boundaries and hang out with other people with those same boundaries. That's religion. 
That's not the Christian faith. All of that is good. It's profitable for your life. It will help you. It will make your life better. There's a reason people follow those religions. It's because they work. Your life generally improves if you do good and you don't do bad. Right? You experience fewer consequences. Your life is generally more peaceful. You don't have as much drama. There's no, no paranoia of being caught doing something bad. If people join a religion and their life got worse, they wouldn't stay a part of that religion very long. Right? Uh, unless you're some kind of sadist, you enjoy pain, you enjoy suffering, you enjoy making your life worse, you wouldn't stay in that religion very long. So there's a reason people go into those religions and they stay in those religions. It's because their life generally improves. If your life gets worse, you're not going to stay in that unless there's a higher reason for it. Most religions make promises that your life will become better. And for the most part, if you engage in their religious system, it will probably make good on some or most of its promises. Your life in the here and now will get better. But every other religion is missing a key ingredient. And that key ingredient is the thing that puts your flesh to death. And that's regeneration. It is the circumcision made without hands. It is the removal of the flesh from the spirit. It is the spirit made alive. There is no other religion that makes that promise. That God will make you alive. That he will remove your flesh. The promise of the Christian faith is that you will be raised with Christ. That is the Christian faith. And until you receive that, you're just doing behavior modification. Prohibitions, asceticism, removing all the earthly things from your life isn't going to make you like Christ if you haven't received the kryptonite. If, if, if you haven't been raised with Christ, your religious practices will mean nothing. Muslims fast. Buddhists meditate to have spiritual fulfillment. Muslims cut themselves off from pork. Hindus cut themselves off from beef. Jainists renounce all worldly possessions. That doesn't mean they're like Christ. Because they haven't been raised with Christ. Cutting yourself off from fleshly passions and desires is good. It's generally, there are generally benefits to it. But the Christian faith is not setting your mind on earthly things because you have been raised. The, the Christian faith is setting your mind on things above because you have been raised. Here's the difference between the Christian faith and every other religion in the world. The promise of religion is if you cut yourself off from earthly things, you will be raised. You'll, you'll attain a higher pl spiritual plane. Uh, God or the gods will accept you. If you cut yourself off from other, other earthly things, you will be raised. The Christian faith is if you descend into the waters of baptism, submitting to Christ and putting your faith in Him, He will raise you up. And then after that, you will be empowered by His Holy Spirit to cut yourself off from earthly things. Every other religion starts with cutting yourself off. The Christian faith ends with cutting yourself off. Because you have been raised, you've been empowered to do it. Cutting yourself off from earthly things is only sustained by the regeneration of our spirit. Paul, Paul made two assertions at Colossians 3.3. One, you have died in your baptism to all things of the earth. 
Included in that is all human traditions, world philosophies, what Paul called the elemental principles of the world in chapter 2. Human traditions and world philosophies, Islam, Buddhism, Hinduism, tribal religions, mystical religions, all of these religions are made up of ascetic practices. But they lack the spiritual renewal that we experience in baptism. The irony of asceticism is that you're trying to remove all the earthly things from your life. You're fasting, removing food, punishing yourself, removing pleasure, denouncing wealth or status. You vow to cut yourself off from all these earthly things. Yet your mind is still focused on an earthly thing, a worldly religion. You're cutting yourself off from things of this earth. And you're still focusing on a religion of this earth and not of heaven. There is one thing that sets your mind on things above, and that's being raised with Christ. Dying in baptism. You have died in your baptism. And the second assertion that he made is that your life is now hidden in Christ. Uh, in, in, in ancient Israel, there was a pagan, or well, in, in ancient times, there was a pagan saying, that to die and be buried is to be hidden in the earth. If someone said, so-and-so is hidden in the earth, that's what they're referring to. They were de de they're dead and buried. Paul said, in baptism, we, we are hidden in Christ. That we die in our baptism. We die and are buried, but we aren't hidden in the earth. We're hidden in Christ. The rest of our life, after our baptism is the hereafter. Our new life in Christ is the hereafter. For the rest of our time that we live here on earth, we are living as though we are already living in the afterlife in heaven. Because we're hidden in Christ. Our new life is hidden in Christ. Where Christ is, Above. We live and we breathe and we go about our daily activities in between two worlds. The physical realm and the spiritual realm. While our bodies move within this physical realm, our spirit moves within the spiritual realm. And in the middle, between our flesh and our spirit is our soul, our mind. And our mind can be set in either direction. It can remain set in the direction of our flesh on earthly things, or it can be reoriented in the direction of our spirit on spiritual things, on things above. Uh, th this, pi this picture um, that we have there, uh, this made rounds on social media last week. It's the picture uh, of the feet of a Buddhist monk. Uh, that's on the left. And then on the right are his... Wait opposite. Uh, so it would be your, your left is his feet. On your right is uh, his footprints that are embedded into the wooden floor where he prayed in the exact same place for decades. You can be just like this Buddhist monk. You can stand in the exact same spot and pray for decades in an effort to attain to a higher spiritual plane. Or you can get baptized and be immediately raised with Christ. You can try and you can try and try to cut yourself off from earthly things or you can be raised with Christ. And God will remove the flesh from your spirit and empower you to live the rest of your life removed from earthly things because your mind will be set on things above. Striving to overcome temptation is merely vain religious activity unless your flesh has died. And that happens in baptism through faith. We're going to move into a time of decision. And if you've never made the decision to be buried in the waters of baptism, to die to your old self and be raised with Christ, to walk in the newness of life, you have that opportunity this morning to make that decision right now.
you can be baptized, made new, raised with Christ, given a heart of flesh. That can happen today. There's, there's nothing magical about the water. It isn't, it isn't that this happens because of the water. There's nothing mystical about the experience of being immersed in the water. It isn't because you engage in that activity that this happens to you. Like there's some kind of force or energy that, that you're being immersed into. Baptism is a promise from God that He will do this spiritual work in that moment if you make the decision to do it and put your faith in Him. He has promised us in His Word that if you fulfill His conditions, He will raise you with Christ in that very moment. And you can do your part by coming this morning to be baptized. And He will do His part in baptism. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for uh, the words of Paul here in Colossians. I pray that you would help us to, to better understand this, this, this moment of baptism where you perform spiritual surgery on our heart. That you change us. That you remove our spirit from our flesh so that we can live the rest of our life for you. God, I pray that you would help us every single day to lean into your spirit, to set our mind on spiritual things and to live our life for you. God, thank you so much that, that the things that we do in our life that we know we don't have to do so that you'll love us. We don't have to do it to earn some sort of reward from you. That we do it because of what you did for us. That, that you have empowered us to do it so that we can help other people into that same relationship with you, so that they too can be changed. God, I pray that you give us all opportunities to tell people how they can be changed in baptism, how you can remove the flesh from their life, and all the things that they do in their life would not be vain, that it would be for you. Thank you for your love and your grace for making that possible. It's in your name I pray. Amen.